In August of 1898, stockholders met and organized the Edenton Cotton Mill. To recruit workers, business leaders went into Terrell and surrounding counties to recruit people to move to Edenton to become employees of the Edenton Cotton Mill. My grandfather was a tenant farmer, and at the end of the year, he had nothing to show for it. So they, they walked, walked, took the carpet bags and walked 13 miles to Edenton. Grinnell got a job and he got a house over here on Church Street. The, the mill provided a steady income, you know, something they, they could do. And, and both the Twitty family and the Whiteman family, I've, I've heard the grandparents say that, that you know, we, we were starving, you know, we were just not making it, and the mill offered a steady income. And they came over and uh, enlisted people to come to work in the mill. They get a house, low rent, garden space. When they came over here, all of a sudden, they had a job. It wasn't a high-paid job, mind you, but you might have three or four members of the family working in the mill, and they all in, in one of the larger houses. So you had a house, you had a job, and you still had the garden that you were living on when you were over in Columbia. And the advantage to the employee was they could walk to work, they could walk to church, their kids could walk to school, the, there were stores on the perimeter, they didn't have to have a car. As an employee of the Edenton Cotton Mill, you were allowed to rent a home from the mill within the village, giving your family a job, adequate shelter, and enough backyard space for your own garden. The number of people that worked in the mill in your family determined how big a house you got. The houses that have two doors on it actually housed two families. And it's hard for me to believe that two families could live. I think they had a room apiece and shared a kitchen. When they first put the water in, it was a spigot on the street. And people had to come in with their buckets, water buckets, and get their drinking water and bathing water and whatever. No bathrooms. Uh, there was an outhouse when I was a little girl. The outhouses, several have I said outhouses, they disappeared sometime after World War II. And then we had what was a utility sink inside with, with water, running water. Mr. Watson would come with a horse and wagon and dump the coal. The mill company made sure that happened. He would dump the coal and they'd put it on a bill up here that we got the coal. That was his job, delivering coal to all the people around here. He had a horse and cart. He, he kept the horse tied up behind the mill. And, you know, during the night, he, he, if he weren't late, it got dark. He'd keep him in that old horse house right there behind the mill. But during the day, he'd deliver coal to everybody's house. And in the beginning, we had a window fan, and there was a way you could open windows and shut doors to make a draft drop through the house. And Mama would do that at night, and I would lay at the foot of the bed and let the breeze blow across me there. A lot of people had gardens because a lot of them were fishermen. They had boat houses at the creek. And on Saturday morning, you could hear boat motors starting up right and left. Working and living on the Mill Village became more than just a job. It became a way of life for many families and stretched across several generations. Uh, two doors down from our house was Miss Sissy. Miss Sissy Wright was her name. She was in her 90s in those days, and she was still living in the mill house where she and her husband had lived, worked, and raised their children. Her grandparents had worked in the mill, her parents had worked in the mill, she and her husband had worked in the mill, and then her children had worked in the mill. He said, the way you work, we sure like to have you at that mill. So. I was the first black person working on the inside. I never had a complaint about laying out. I never had a complaint about I didn't do my work. I was a working man. Well, when I first went to work there, I was in school. Al Phillips gave me a job sweeping the floor. I made a dollar an hour. My woman was 16 years old. You know, I made eight dollars a day. And that was a lot of money for me back then in the 50s. My history is I started when I was a teenager. Uh, they had a summer program uh, back in the 60s, uh, latter 60s. And uh, uh, they hired, you know, young kids. And so there's a sort of a, a graduation that you can see from Columbia 
through the generation, each one getting economically better off. They worked hard. Our parents and grandparents worked really hard and they knew the value of good work and they knew that they could do better for themselves, but they especially wanted to do better for their children. The formation of the Edenton Cotton Mill in 1900 strengthened the economy of the town of Edenton as no previous industrial pursuits had done. The cotton mill was organized and funded entirely by local men, and the profits remained in the town. My grandfather, James William Cates, he was the superintendent here from 1921 until his death in 1949. But I know that he had a great amount of respect in the community. They were good people. They were respected and some dearly beloved. Like Philip McMullen. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. He was beloved by the people who lived on the mill village. He came in 1919 as shipping clerk, uh, working in the back, but he spent a lot of time learning all about the equipment in here. And it wasn't, he had already had two years at uh, Trinity College, which is now Duke. So. Uh, they had him in the office fairly soon. I could walk in this office and the president knew me by name. They knew all of they the all children. Knew all of us. They got to be real good friends with us. You know, that's why I said on the last, they were nice, like a family thing. Right. Black and white. The mill did not have a company store. So that the people here increased the um, business in the downtown stores. I heard one of uh, the man at the shoe store would give credit to the people over here, and some people in town would ask him why he would do that, and he said because they pay their bills. Growing up in the village provided a number of benefits. Residents never lacked friends to experience life with, always had a place to play, and were never without a built-in support system when it was needed. It was a unique experience. People were good people, plain, ordinary, hard-working people and we lived in a village-type environment, which it is. I knew every single person that lived in every single house on this mill village. You know, the kids were all over, everywhere, everybody's, everybody's house was everybody's house, you know. You never lacked for, for playmates. Oh, I, well, it was a great place to live. I mean, great growing up in this place, it was the greatest place in the world, I thought. Uh, I wouldn't change my childhood for nothing, and and you had to behave yourself and you had to uh, conduct yourself in a nice manner. But everything is generational and people change, time change, and places change and events change. The mill, um, as I said, shut down. It was sold in 1990 to a company from Sanford, North Carolina, and it was Pioneer Yarns. And then it was sold in 93 to a large conglomerate which was Unify. Unify was convinced to donate the property to Preservation North Carolina. Uh, when Preservation North Carolina was given the gift of this property, they sold the Mill Village houses that were salvageable to people who would remodel it. Miss Sissy was the oldest lady on the here that you know, worked in the mill. And I'd go sit on her porch. She was 90 some years old then. And I go sit on my porch and we would talk about, please don't let them tear the house this time. This is a memory. This is a life. It will always be. Otherwise, these buildings would have just rotted down, fallen down, been torn apart. And now this is a vibrant, charming neighborhood. You know, we needed something that would tell the story here. This museum that we have you know, tell us that story. Preservation has done a wonderful job in keeping this preserved uh, and also making it modern. It's probably been one of the highlights of my life. Uh, I completely changed careers when I went to work at PNC, but to see it come alive, to see it um, develop like it was developed, and to see what came out of this, um, has just kind of been, it's been one of the biggest um, thrills in my life. This video is dedicated to all the men and women who were employed by the Edenton Cotton Mill.
from its beginning in 1900 until its closing in 1995. As they worked hard to support their families, they also formed a close-knit Mill Village family while making valuable contributions to the economy of the town of Edenton.